Now, it is absolutely my pleasure to introduce a dear friend. For over 15 years, certified speaking professional, Michelle Cedar has captivated audiences across North America with her empowering and humorous messages about how to set worthwhile goals, get energized for success, and live a carpe freaking diem life. <laughs> An in-demand speaker, author, coach, and consultant. She believes that personal and professional success is directly influenced by how well we harness the physical, mental, and emotional capacity we each have within us. She helps people boost that capacity so they gain clarity, build confidence, and create the discipline to do the freaking work. She holds a master's in kinesiology, a BA in psychology, a specialization in health and exercise psychology, is a certified exercise physiologist, a certified professional co-active life coach, and an O, is that O, O, F, I, C, yep. Yeah, a C, trained team coach. She truly combines mind body and practicality to empower power change. So please in the chat and with the emojis, please give Michelle a thunderous welcome and, uh, and please thank her for joining us. She's going to share insights <coughs> from her new book, the success energy equation. And I should mention, if you have questions, you can put it in the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on that. And also, or actually in the Q&A section, you can see in the chat there, there there's a Q&A there. You can put it there and that'll be easier to spot for me when, uh, when they're in there. So Michelle, welcome aboard. Glad to be here. Yeah. So Michelle, when, as I mentioned to you, when I was going through your book again, the, your success energy equation. And, and, and I, 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 I'm chuckling because we were chatting backstage before this happened and, and you're saying like, you hate math. Why would you do an equation? But <laughs> the, there were elements in that, that, that you had, you were talking about being on autopilot, 12 signs you're on autopilot. And yeah. it really struck me that there are signs of pandemic fatigue. Yeah. It's interesting because I, I finished writing this book in January of 2020, long before the gravity of the situation that we're currently in really sunk in. But as we were going through the last 14 months, I realized, wow, like a lot of things that I wrote about will help us get through. But a lot of stuff I wrote about is actually what we're living right now. And so the autopilot signs that you mentioned, like 12 signs you're on autopilot, that's something that many of us have been plagued with even before we were stuck yeah. in this groundhog day existence that is pandemic living. But for most of us, we just don't really pay attention to it. So autopilot living, the 12 steps that I say are that your routine is predictable. Uh, you don't look forward to the day ahead. Uh, you start your day you know, with your device or you do things without thinking or you say yes without pause or this is an interesting one for the pandemic. Your success path feels stalled or you procrastinate the good stuff. And all of these things on this list, when you mentioned it, that they kind of feel like what we're going through right now, I went, <laughs> yes. You know, this 12 signs of autopilot is a good description of what we're all going through right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like which, which pair of uh, slacks uh, of, of you know, track pants am I going to put on today? Right. And, uh, but, and, and I'm, I'm going to ask, let, let's see emojis. How many people, when you wake up, first thing you do is you grab your device within the first five minutes. Let's see the oh, emojis. Are people going to admit that? Ooh. Yeah. yeah. It's a tough one. Hey, and there's a, there's an inordinate amount of research that suggests that one, that I, I, I can't even be the right number, but it's in excess of 80% of individuals will check their phones before even getting out of bed. And that is not the right way to start the day. It is a sure sign to put yourself into other people's uh, urgencies and other people's emergencies and not connecting with yourself. So instantly you are on autopilot dealing with, you know, other yeah. stuff. Although I like Teresa's response. She has to make coffee first. I, I'm with you. <laughs> well, and I, that is a really, uh, we can laugh about that. I need my coffee. But if you do that mindfully, you know, sit and 
think about your day while the kettle's boiling or just sit and savor that cup of coffee as a starting point to your day before getting into your device. That's actually a moment of mindfulness that's very worthwhile. Yeah, really the thing is, <laughs> I, I mean, for me, when I make a latte, it is a mindfulness exercise to be present. And it like, should be but, because lattes are wonderful, right? The whole steaming of the milk and mm -hmm. the smell of the coffee and yeah. Totally. The thing is, it's hard because my alarm clock is this beast, right? As well. And it's so I, I've gotten to putting it across the room for when I need an alarm. But and it's, well, it, I, I will say that there are these things that you can buy at a drugstore called alarm clocks, which <laughs> you, know, you could plug in next to your bed. And well, just saying. <laughs> just saying. Yeah. Okay, fine. But it's just that it, it serves so many functions. It's hard to well, let go. And it, yeah, it, the, the interesting thing about our devices now, and I write a lot about um, our devices in the success energy equation because they're not going away, but they are taking yes. over our lives. We don't mm -hmm. necessarily want them to go away. We do need to learn how to uh, live with them better because the people who design these devices have designed them in a, in a, in a way that hooks our neural pathways in the same way that gambling and addiction does. Now think about that. And so throughout the pandemic, this has been a lifeline to the outside world for, for, for months now. Even if we felt like we were connected to it before, we are most certainly connected to it now to text or Zoom our family that are in other provinces or across the city and right. we can't see them, to check in the workplace, to check in with news, to entertain ourselves with social media or Pinterest or um, streaming uh, television shows or whatever. This is a powerful little machine, but it's, you know, it's our connection, but it's also our distract downfall. And I know that many of, of the listeners would admit to feeling that drain of too much device time, too much comparisonitis, too much doom scrolling. Um, it's an interesting challenge because they're not going away. So we got to get to them better. <laughs> yeah. Cause I mean, it's so easy to lose time just scrolling, right? It's yeah. So the, all of these things, these 12 symptoms you mentioned about autopilot to me, they are resilience sucks. They take away your resilience. Would you agree? Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. So, so how do we counter that Michelle? How do we, how do you know, what are steps we can take to start to, well, and I think, I, the, you know, before I answer that, I, I, I want to mention that autopilot does serve a, a function in our lives at times. And, and like Vince mentioned yesterday, um, if you weren't on, on that call, then go and listen to the recording. If there's a recording, is there a recording Vince? <laughs> he yeah, about there the is a recording and we'll get them up in, uh, in a, a couple of weeks in the Facebook group and LinkedIn group, I'll be letting Wonderful. you guys know about. Because he talked about the fact that we have, you know, um, 2000 or so conscious neurons that connect to our mind and about 4 billion that connect to our, our subconscious. And so with that many working for us subconsciously, it's a wonder that we ever have any moment being able to be present. But we're yeah. processing a lot of information all day long and autopilot is your brain's way of managing everything that it has coming at us on a given day because we can't process it all. Otherwise <laughs> we'd literally blow our minds. But what happens is autopilot should just be coming in as an opportunity to help us process or focus on what's in front of us. So it brings a lot of stuff into the subconscious that we can just kind of let it happen behind the scenes. But when autopilot becomes your go-to operating system, that's when the problems start to happen, where we get up and we don't pay attention to, um, you know, what we need for ourselves or we're working wrong things. Or we're saying yes, just because somebody's asking, or we're not paying attention to where we're going or, uh, what we need for ourselves in any given moment. And I know that many of your listeners can probably identify with that, where we, you know, we get through part of the day and, and have been working steadily, but haven't necessarily made a dent in the things that matter or haven't taken a break because you haven't listened to what your body needs. And that's autopilot kind of pulling you into, you know, zoning out, if you will. Um, and because we are, are on a, um, on a loop <laughs> right now with our day to day, if you're working from home, it's fairly groundhoggish. You know, you're seeing the same people and, and seeing the same view out your front window and the only person that's happy to see you every day, dog. And it, it's very easy to, um, you know, kind of 
to feel that stuckness. So we, we need to pay attention to right here and not right now, what do we need for ourselves? Uh, the simple question that, that, that I um, mentioned in the book is one that all coaches will be able to resonate with, um, is to just simply start your day by asking yourself, what do I need for myself right now? What do I need? And, and, for the, and, and part of that is not letting your phone be the first entry point into the day. Most of us will um, reach for the phone in the darkness of, of you know, the early morning and use it as our first entry point in the day. But as soon as we do that, we're letting the outside world and all the messages infiltrate. We're letting our email uh, inbox hijack our plans for the day. But instead, what would happen if you were just to lay there for a couple minutes and, uh, and just check in with yourself? Check in with, with yourself before checking in with the world, if you will. And just see, how did I sleep? What do I want myself today? What do I feel like I need to get accomplished? Uh, these simple questions that you can ask yourself just to get grounded in what's important right here, right now. And that, that can't happen on autopilot. There's a right. lot of other interesting things that we can do to get ourselves out of autopilot. I can share some of them if you like. Yeah, so that, I mean, that morning, first when you wake up, that, to me, there, there's a choice of autopilot or mindfulness. And when, yeah, when do you, 100%. when do you, so that when, when you're waking up, what are op other opportunities during the day to say, this is, this is a door to mindfulness and this is the time I've got to make for it. I, uh, for me, the way we start our work day is going to, um, be a game changer. So if you just sit down at your desk, whether it's at your kitchen table or somewhere else in your home, or you're leaving to go to the office. What's the first thing that you do to really enter into the day intentionally? Because many of us will just use email as our entry point once again, but I challenge you to use those first few, two or three, maybe five minutes to sit at your desk and just take stock. What, what's the one, two, three things that I really want to accomplish today to make today successful? And let that email wait. It's already waited for eight, 10 hours since you, well, I shouldn't say that since you last checked it, it might not be that long, but, <laughs> but people can wait to, for you to just get intentional about what are the things that I need to accomplish today in order to be successful. And that can include, when am I going to fit in some movement and fresh air and activity? When am I going to schedule my breaks and those kinds of things? Because I think we need to do that, um, probably more now than ever. Yeah. And, and that, I mean, I can test to that in that I found this winter more challenging because ever since COVID, uh, you know, you know, me, my big passion is dance and that got yeah. cut off. Uh, so I started doing way more beach walks last year and hikes. And then when it got cold, it's like, you, you do not want to be on most of these beaches when whipping that, right? So there's a lot less. And I found that heaviness growing more and I had to find you know, those opportunities, even to walk around the neighborhood for a block, uh, it, it, it was harder in the winter. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I live in Calgary and the winters here are cold as well. I mean, it's that dry cold that everybody says it's a lot more bearable, but there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothing. <laughs> and thankfully we are heading into warmer weather, but you, you think about that, that movement or how you take care of yourself physically, that's a resilience practice that every single one of us has control over. But when we get busy, it's usually the first stuff that we push aside in the name of getting more work done. And, and that's not how we work. And that's definitely not how we should be working nowadays, you know, where, where the borders between work and life are very blurred. If totally. we don't make time for taking care of ourselves and for um, being present with our family or, or you know, doing things that we love outside of work, then we become very one dimensional. And it, we do get into that autopilot humdrum of the groundhog, the groundhoggedness. <laughs> right. Groundhoggedness. Is that a word? <laughs> it is now. It's Interestingly, I mean, you know, people took up baking uh, during the <laughs> pandemic, people took up all sorts of different um, hobbies that they might not have done before. Um, even trying new exercise practices. And, and I'll tell you that all, all of those things are ways to get off of autopilot because when we are, when we are making, when we are crafting, when we are moving, when we are doing, when you're using our hands or our bodies, we can't be on autopilot. If I'm, um, you know, mountain biking down a hill, I have to play, pay full attention to what's in front of me. I can't, I can't be on my phone. I can't 
be yeah. mind wandering or worrying. I got to be fully present. If I've got my hands, you know, in the dough, you know, or mixing up the burgers or whatever it is that I'm making, being, um, I'm present and it's a really good thing. Right. So this, this may be a good door to get into what are the elements of your success energy equation? Cause I think we're, we're alluding to different pieces of it here Yeah, and, and let's, let's dive into that. Yeah. Well, and you know, as I said earlier, I wrote a book called the success energy equation and I don't like math, but <laughs> I like the idea of, of concepts coming together. And so I talk about four factors in my success energy equation. The first is setting clear and exciting goals. So knowing what you want and being resonant with what those things are. It's not somebody else's goal, it's yours. And then, you know, the success of those goals are a function of the belief we have in ourselves and the discipline to do the work. So those two factor into helping us set better goals. Now, as an equation in and of itself, those three factors would help us get to success. Have the goal and have the belief in, in yourself and the discipline to do the work, you're going to achieve the goal. But my... Um, a uh, magic multiplier, if you will, is the fourth factor, and that's energy. Energy as the magic multiplier of success. And, and so when we take our energy and take care of ourselves physically, mentally, emotionally, cognitively, and that's my wheelhouse, we'll set bigger goals. We'll have higher belief in ourselves. We will have more energy to do the things that we have set out to do. And so all of the energetic pieces drive the first three factors to higher levels and and Yes, success still requires effort and it still is a little bit of work, but you're going to have uh, energy and resilience on your side. And uh, that's the powerful thing because it's the first thing that most people push aside when they get busy, but it's the, the thing that people should be holding on dear to, especially now. Okay, so I want to get into each of those, but just briefly before we do, how do you see resilience fitting into this equation or, or what is the... What is the interaction with the equation in resilience? Well, I kind of, I, I needed that energy piece to be in there because this physical machinery and the brilliant mind in it is what's driving the mission day after day after day. And you can experience high levels of success if you don't exercise, if you don't eat right, if you don't get enough sleep, if you drink too much or you smoke, or you've got no life balance or stress, you can still experience high levels of, of success. Many people do. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are saying, oh, thank God. But that is the <laughs> absolute truth, right? But the reality of it is that you won't be able to operate at your full potential. And it, well, it, it'll it come across over time, you know, it'll to your, to your productivity, to your health, to the people around you. And that's the resilience piece. What good is success if everything else has, has, has become de-energized, if you will? So the, okay. my, you know, the res resilience piece to me is how do we work hard and, and find success and still have energy left at the end of the day for the people and things that matter most, ultimately. Good. Now with, uh, with this, let's dive into the goals. Like one of the things you do is you say, when you're talking goals, it is not the smart goals we talked about in the nineties. So, I think right. smart, smart goals, goals are dumb, dumb. I believe you said. <laughs> huh? I do. I, I, I think that dumb. And, and you know, I, when I first came on to smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, time-based, I thought, yeah, sure, makes sense. But I never got this, geez, that's exciting. And it, it never helped me to reach my goals. And so when I was doing my coaching certification many years ago, um, the program that I was in introduced me to a different way of setting goals and it's still smart, but it's beginning, you know, it's putting the art and smart and beginning with the end in mind. And that's how I describe it. So time-based is usually the T. And I think we do have to have some sort of a time attached to our goals, because if they're yeah. so gigantic that we can't see the end, then we'll, we'll get overwhelmed. We've got to break it down into bite-sized time manageable pieces. So keep the T, but I'm going to add a little other uh, other part to that. So the, the, the T that I add is to is to frame your goal in a way that is thrilling. And most of us, if we've set goals, um, you know, the ones that just don't go away, they're there and they pop up and you might not do anything with them, but they never go away. And maybe you have some goals like that, Ravi, I know probably everybody that's listening does. One of mine was to write a book. Another was to write a marathon, or run a marathon. And as long as I wasn't doing those things, they would still keep popping up. That's the thrilling aspect of a goal. The one that's like, oh God, scares the heck out of me, but why does it not yeah. let me 
forget about it. So that's a thrilling piece. The R is usually realistic. We want to stretch ourselves a little bit because everything good happens outside your comfort zone. So instead of the R being realistic, uh, I say, uh, frame your goals in a way that makes it resonant. So it vibrates within you. So when you, you know, can't, when you think about it, you can't wait to get to it. So if I use the marathon, um, as an example, it was a thrilling idea for me to marathon, but it, it didn't really sink into my bones and become resonant until I decided, oh, if I'm going to run a marathon, I'm going to go somewhere fun and amazing to do it, <laughs> now, right? A destination Smart. marathon. I'm going to go to Honolulu in Denver. And that got me excited. I get to run the race and fulfill one of my other passions, which is traveling. And so then it's like, oh, then it started to get exciting, but I still wasn't running all that much. <laughs> so here's the, here's the magic one. So A is usually evil. And I think that's ridiculous. It's ridiculously redundant. We all set goals to achieve them. So we just need to drop kick achievable out of there. Right. And, and make the A, the one that none of us want, but every one of us needs accountable. If, if we don't have some sort of accountability for our goals, we will continue to push them aside. If we don't tell anybody, if we don't create a system that holds our, ourselves accountable, it's very easy to dismiss. It's why we don't tell people our goals. Cause then if I don't work on it, I can fail in private. But why do we set goals? We want to achieve them. So the accountability piece, magic. And for me on the goal, on the, the marathon running, it was signing up for the University of Calgary, Calgary Honolulu Marathon training program that met twice a week for long and short run and an education session with 27 other people who had the same goals who, if I didn't show up for a run, you better bet I had multiple text messages or emails saying, where the heck were you? When are you going to redo it? Can I come with you on your makeup run? And all 27 of us who signed up for that program uh, completed the marathon that we had set out to complete. So, and then specific and measurable, they can be the same. The, the specific and measurable is 26.2 miles on December 5th, 20, 2005, right. which, you know, yeah. so you see how it works. It's pretty, pretty, um, it's pretty inspiring. So we have to think about our goals in a way that lights up, light us up and get not that heavy goals, but thrilling goals. I love it. Thrilling. If it's, if it's not, I mean, it should scare you a bit for certain, but you know, if it doesn't also excite you a little bit, then you want to maybe okay, think about I have how to, to share. You know what that flashes me, you know what that flashes me back to, don't you? No, I don't. Uh, Wayne Lee. Uh, several oh, years ago. Yeah. At, at our Purple Speakers Convention, uh, Wayne Lee is a colleague of ours, is a stage hypnotist and he brought, was, at, uh, was it 2004 Edmonton, I think? Yep. Uh, yeah, that's when you and I met. And, yeah. and Shell was up there and he, he was getting people to visualize some amazing goal and yours, I, I still remember your excitement. Yeah. Yeah, my goal was to get my certified speaking professional designation. And at the time I had been speaking professionally for two years, I, like I, had just become a member of our speakers association. I was far from that goal, but I had, I felt it in my body, you know, and I had also, I had also stated that in front of an audience of 300 of my speaking peers. And so that was accountability piece. And I don't know if any of them remembered it or if they even cared, but I did. And so I, I kept totally remember. To that goal. And I remember mm -hmm. the thrilling part. You were so excited. I can still remember how that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And I achieved the goal. I achieved that goal, my certified speaking professional designation, um, exactly five years after becoming a full-time member of the association or, or moving full-time in my speaking business. So, uh, in 2010, I got my certified speaking professional right. designation six years yeah. after that uh, stage moment with Lee. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So that's goals. Now the belief, I think this is something that probably undermines a lot of people because even those who seem confident, I think, of, you know, many of the people that I've coached or worked with in retreats, they, you know, they come across very strong, very confident, but then there's a lot of self doubts that people carry. Would you I wrote this chapter for myself, um, you know, through years, my own self doubt and roller coaster, um, imposter syndrome and what have you that I still go through every now and then. Um, I, I think that all of us have those moments and I think that that self-doubt or imposter syndrome comes when we are pushing outside that comfort zone 
But the difference is if we can overcome that self-doubt and keep moving forward, then we're going to grow. But if we let that self-doubt retreat us back into the comfort zone, that's where we inhibit our possibilities. And the reason why I think that belief is such an important, important element in everything we do is it doesn't matter how big the goal is if you don't believe in your ability to, to accomplish it. You can set the most gigantic goal, but if in here you're going, meh, not going to happen, then what's the point? We need to you know, trust in our abilities. It's one of the reasons why I became a coach, Ravi, um, because I kept meeting people who had no idea how extraordinary they were. And, and mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to be able to have the tools to draw that out of people that, you know, yes. my, um, my website tagline totally. is empowering today's dreamers, leaders, and go-getters to create the life and career that they want. And I talked to a lot of, um, you know, people in leadership roles to help them realize, yes, you absolutely deserve to be here. You absolutely deserve a seat at the table. You should absolutely apply for that, that promotion, whatever it might be, because every one of us has in, in us this idea that maybe not, you know, a lot of us have learned how to manage it, but a lot of us will still be in, in, uh, you know, positions of power and leadership wondering, you know, when is somebody going to pull back and reveal the fraud that I am? Well, none of us are, because I think all of us are capable of, of great things if we just set our mind to it. So that's the belief chapter. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> well, and I think the belief uh, to me, that's a key one because it is, it can, it can, I'm disciplined. And it can undermine the energy part because if, if you don't believe in yourself, you often sabotage yourself, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that all of them are linked in a way and, and I, I will d directly connect energy with uh, self-belief because um, as, a, as a kinesiologist, as a exercise physiologist, I, I, I got my start in the health realm. So I, ha I put a big belief in physical health for personal professional growth in, in physical health for emotional wellness mm -hmm. and mental focus and all the things that we need to drive to higher levels if we're feeling physically strong it's going to drive our mental health and our emotional wellness and so they are connected belief is an interesting one though because we do have to be able to you know talk to ourselves better and 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 hear what we're saying to ourselves and determine what is you know realistic or, or, or not, um, you know, yeah. what, what voice should we listen to and, and which one should we, you know, have choice words for. <laughs> and I know Patricia is going to be getting into that, that, those internal voices as well on Thursday. Uh, yeah. so, and, and I just got to do a call out. This is about service, right? Patricia is coming to, as one of our speakers, but she is also sharing her, you know, summary as this goes along in the chat. I mean, that, that's, uh, such amazing service totally unasked for so thank you thank patricia. you patricia morgan <laughs> so discipline to me discipline is another thing when we've got those 12 signs of autopilot it's hard to get into the it, it's almost like you've built a habit of undiscipline right so it's, well it's i mean that's an interesting way of putting it but at the same time we all have discipline for some don't we you know okay uh, you know, I'll, I'll ask, you know, entire audiences, you know, in those days when we can meet in person, I could have hundreds of people in an audience and I'll, I would say, how many of you think you don't have any discipline? And a good portion of the audience will put their hands up because they're thinking about those things that they've been putting off that they really want to get to. They're not exercising. They're not creating the website. They're not writing the book. They're not uh, starting the business, whatever it might be. We all have those goals and dreams that we kind of put out there. Um, so let's but, ask emojis. How many people think they don't, they have discipline, think they don't have discipline? How many emojis. Of you? Huh? How, who we'll thinks see. they don't have discipline? Who thinks they don't have discipline? Do Nobody's going to answer it down because I said that everybody does. Oh, there's a, there's a couple of you. I appreciate your honesty. And at the same time, we, you know, when you think about all of the uh, balls that you're juggling right now in life, pre COVID, during COVID, post COVID, family, health care, uh, taking care of your aging parents, work, commute, uh, getting groceries, doing the taxes, juggle, juggle, juggle. There's a lot of things that you're doing every single day that require your discipline. And when I talk about the discipline for success, it's doing all of those things, those other things that we know are going to take us to the next level. Right now, we're keeping it all together and everything's good. And in order to get to that next level, we've got to find that extra time and energy to do the things that we know are going to get us there. And so my definition of discipline is to do the things you don't want to do 
that you know you need to do because it'll drive your success to higher levels. You want to, you're going to do them even when you don't want to, because you know, it'll drive your success. Um, to find the time and energy for that is therein lies the challenge. Um, cause then you got to say no to other things. You've got to learn how to set distractions aside and do the hard work. I'm trying to build an online program right now, as you know, Ravi, and it's outside my comfort zone. And every time I sit down on my computer, I will find other things to do because all of that is novel and scary and hard work for me. And, and I have to just push aside the distractions and say, okay, I'm going to create one more module. I'm going to create one more page. I'm going to do one more thing to move this forward. And that's kind of the idea. What are the things that you want to be spending more time at that you're not? Yeah. And how to get the discipline and energy of course feeds into that as well. <laughs> Right. So let me get into that. That makes me think of yesterday when we were chatting, you'd mentioned about how when the pandemic hit, for those of us in the speaking world, we remember March 11th, everything in the world canceled. And um, you said you went into a bit of a funk uh, or, yep. or uh, in, into neutral. How was your journey to build your discipline back up? What did specific things did you do to start to move from that. Can you share? Yeah. You know, and I had my last in-person presentation on March 11th and I, I, um, on March 12th, I, I was in Edmonton on March 11th. I flew back. I had a presentation in Calgary on March 12th, which was the last, because after that, everything in Calgary anyways, shut down. And I got out of that presentation and opened up my email and had multiple emails from clients coming up in, in April, May, June, um, September that were all saying we're on hold, we're on hold, we're on hold. And I, like many of you, I got kind of thought, all right, well, this is really strange. This is very weird. I'm just going to sit here and, you know, ride out our two week lockdown and then we'll get on with it. Um, it's like Vince was saying yesterday, it's like, I'm just going to video a day, for three weeks tops, right? And now he's over 200 videos. Um, for the first couple of weeks I sat there, I was numb and I just sat there and processed it and um, mourned the loss of what was looking to be one of my best years on the books uh, to date and just took it all in. You know, like there was people that were jumping on the bad wagon. I'm going to create the studio. I'm going to create the programs to help people through. And I'm like, I don't even know how to help myself. That's kind of like what Vince was saying. I got a knife stuck in my leg. I can't, I can't until I deal with this until I dealt with mental and emotional state, I couldn't do anything. So I just sat back and I processed. Um, and it was, and then I slowly started to, I had never done online prior to, mm -hmm. and you know, my first couple webinars were clunky and, and very awkward and, um, a very simple setup, you know, sat in front of my computer in my downstairs office. And, and now, I mean, if you look, I've got a bigger <laughs> setup of, for which I'm grateful. It took me, you know, eight months to, you know, a good studio together and to feel comfortable and confident in the, the virtual world. And I'm grateful because I'm married to a photographer and videographer who makes all of this uh, easier and help with, from my friends like Ravi with the technical side of things, but little by little I get to take on a little bit more um, and find my way through. Cause I've, you know, but you know, I had to do something that was comfortable for me um, in, in the virtual realm. And I'm actually enjoying it quite a lot now. I'd like to get back to in-person, but you know, I'm set up. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, you allowed yourself to grieve. And then yeah. it was that one step at a time. Yeah. Not trying to um, do it and, all. And, and anybody who works, you know, with others, you know, whether you're a, or a, a, a therapist like Patricia Morgan is, or, you know, it's, it, there has to be a little bit of physician heal thyself. I'm no good to anybody else if I haven't fully addressed what's going mm -hmm. on with me. And you know, the pause was two weeks and in the grand scheme of things, you know, that's taking a two week holiday life, life can continue on after that. And I really just needed to be in it and just look around and see what other people were doing. But the very interesting thing is, you know, that numbness, it eventually, uh, subsided and I started to make steps forward as, as so many of you that are on this, uh, meeting today, but we're now 14 months in. Um, and it's been a roller coaster. You've heard that term a lot um, because everything changes week to week, month to month, and we've had to process all of that. So 
you know, I, I, even last week I was like, oh, are you kidding me? Like, I'm just done with this. In January, I was like, oh my God, it's not actually coming to an end anytime soon and went through highs and lows. And so I, I will say to all, the, all of you that are listening now, you know, even though we're over a year into it, you know, we can't expect to have it all figured out. Um, the finish line keeps moving, you know? Yes. And so it's okay to not be okay even now. That's why having this ramp up resilience summit now is probably more powerful and more necessary than if we had chosen to do it same time last year. Because right. we didn't know what we didn't know about how hard this was going to be and how resilient we could all be to push our way through it. Yeah. Well, the <clears throat> where resilience I encountered a lot first was when I was working with the Red Cross and they talked about communities being resilient, like after the Slave Lake fire and coming back. But it's very much personal about how do we come back. And I love what you said about the roller coasters, that it's yeah. not about, okay, I'm good. Let's roll. We're ready to go, right? No. Expose the S and... and uh, it's like feel all the feels, be in it, be vulnerable, you know, be human. You know, this is yeah. unprecedented. I'm just, that, that's the only pivot word I'm going to use. I think that's huge though. If you talk about resilience, it's to be gentle enough to let yourself have those feels, to let yourself be in it. I, I mean, th there's a line between sort of venting and wallowing. <laughs> that yeah. Comes but, but, but you have there, to there's be a able time to... you need to. Because if you're not in that moment, if you, if you don't sit there and allow it all to land, then you're not going to know which tools to pick up when it is time to move forward. Because you haven't listened to your head and your heart and what your body and mind need it's okay to mourn the loss of, you know, I was going to get to go to Bond Resort in Toronto, Toronto area for the first time ever. I've heard it's lovely. I still haven't been, you know, <laughs> there was all sorts of places that I was looking forward to speaking, you know, in Halifax, I would have come and visited you, Ravi, um, all, you know, off the books. And I just sat there and went, what, this is not air. You know, I cried a few tears and beat my head against the wall. But when, it, you know, when it came time to pick up the pieces, it's like, all right, now what do I need and what do I want? And I definitely know I want to keep doing what I'm doing, even if I have to do it virtually. I started coaching more because people needed people to talk to. I, yeah. I had the, I had the, the, the great gift of being able to edit my book unencumbered. I would have been doing it on a plane. I would have been fitting it in when I could. And I had these giant swaths of time where I wasn't traveling, where I could really just focus on doing the best possible job, getting that book to market in October, which right. um, I view as a gift. And so it really is about, about viewing the hard stuff for sure, but also recognizing um, gifts in it. And that when all this ends, we might choose to keep some of those gifts rather than fully reverting back to what life was like before, which is also a resilience choice in my mind. Yes. Now let's get into your joie de vivre energy, because I think <laughs> the thing is, imagine how you would have dealt with this if you weren't doing the, the, the trail biking and the hiking and all of that, that you do, which uh, without that, it would be, I would imagine have been just almost insurmountable. Yeah. And, you know, even before COVID, I, I put a lot of, um, of energy towards outdoors and movement and, and uh, taking care of myself. It's, you know, one of the high values that I have mm -hmm. is personal health and, <clears throat> and nature. Um, but it was, you know, had to, it was the tail end of winter when it all kicked down. And um, right at the very beginning, I made a, a, a pact with myself that every single day would involve some sort of outdoor uh, movement, even if it was just a walk around the neighborhood. Um, and it would include some sort of non-work related fun, uh, whether it was playing Scrabble with my husband or watching movie or playing our fat bikes in the winter, um, something, or having a Zoom call with friends because the Zoom cocktails, you know, was a thing yeah. before it got a little tiring. <laughs> but uh, to take care of myself in those small ways. Um, so vitally important because if we're not taking care of the physical machinery, then it's very easy to kind of sink into not only physical fatigue, but just, you know, the emotional blahs and, and uh, um, that autopilot, um, not things to look forward to um, way of being. And 
you know, as much as my business wasn't where it was, I was not going to let my life get to somewhere where I didn't want it to be. Right. And it's, I remember there was a program we did almost a, a year ago, like shortly after I was listening to you speaking and you were talking about, you know, like just to get out of the door, just to do whatever. And that's, you know, when I allude to the winter where I couldn't take longer hikes because it was so cold and the, I would at least, can I walk, you know, your voice in my head, you know, just get out the door and go around the block. Just do well, and and Mother Nature is um, she's she's awesome at getting us off autopilot, even if it's even if it's an in you know urban walking. And uh, you know, very early on, I had a a colleague whose eight year old daughter wasn't taking well to homeschooling, um, very social kid, and so they started their day by walking to school out the front door, around a little pond that was in their neighborhood, had a little chit chat, movement, science conversation, and they would come back in the front door and sit down. And, and be at school. And so I thought, what a great idea to apply yourself to anybody working from home to walk yourself mm -hmm. to work every single day. Just get out the front door, walk around a couple blocks, come on in and then make that line between life and work a little more solid. Go into the office, do the work. And at the end of the day, walk yourself home. And just those little connections with outdoors and fresh air and movement, um, it gives us a sense of control and also a sense of calm you know, that's more about feeding your brain than it is about your body, but both benefit. Well, and I think there's a healing aspect to being in nature and especially around water. For me, yes, I'm, I'm envious of your ocean. We have the river here, though. We have the Mighty Bow River, and, and uh, I walk my dog every single day at a park that uh, that is right along the river. And she loves the river, too. Dogs are very intuitive. <laughs> So it's, you know, if you find water, I know when I lived in Winnipeg, I found, you know, Granby or, or, you know, the rivers there, I found my spots that I would go to. Uh, and and it's, it is nourishing, but it's, again, a lot of these, uh, the, the discipline, the, the, the uh, energy about nourishing yourself. It would is. you say that that's a key piece element to resilience about being able to <laughs> nourish yourself? Yes, and, and I, as I mentioned earlier, when we get busy doing life, uh, when we get busy, you know, and right now, I said work and life are kind of inextricably linked, the boundaries are blurred. We are working, we're on a Zoom meeting, then we've got to go and help our, you know, kid at the kitchen table with their math problem, and then we come back to another meeting, and then we've got to come and make lunch for the family, and we're go, 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 go. We don't stop long enough to kind of fill, refill the vessel, and we've heard that term before, um, you're not going to be good to anybody. And the way that I've been trying to help people through kind of at this tail end of COVID, if you will, is to remind people that we have control over the resilience practices that we need to sustain whatever's left. So many of us are like, they keep moving the finish line. I would rather that we stop asking ourselves, where's the damn finish line and start asking ourselves, what do I need to do to be able to keep going? Right. Think about that. What do I need to be able to do in order to keep going if this lasts another year, God forbid? What do I need to do in, in, able to, in order to keep going so that when life gets quote unquote back to normal, I've got my health, I've got my relationships intact, I've got a business that's still sustainable. Um, what are the th little things I need to do for myself? Where's the finish line is a crazy question because they keep moving it. And you know how uh, frustrating it is to, to you know, keep running and not know when you're ending, <laughs> right? What do you need to do to so, keep going? So let me ask, a, a, just to sort of pull things together, a little twist on that. What do you need to keep going? And what do you not let go of to go back to the normal because when when this is over there's going these are the habits we want to keep we want to maintain yeah. yeah it's a great it's a great question and i and i think that all of us need to really take stock of what have been the gifts in all of this um it's very ironic uh, very not ironic it's strange to me that pre covid it never occurred to me to have zoom gatherings with my family, all of whom are in British Columbia, including my 85 year old mother, who she doesn't hear very well, but she loves sitting on Zoom calls while her nieces and, and nephew and 
um, daughters and daughters-in-law have these raucous conversations getting caught up. Why did we never do that before? And as much as I've got Zoom fatigue, I will keep doing that when I can't travel to BC to see them. You know, I daily movement of some sort. I'm a high active person. And so if it wasn't a hour long bike ride or a good exercise class or a nice strong weight workout, I wasn't doing anything, but now every single day I'm outside and yes, my dog helps, but that's going to continue. It, you know, even right. if it's low intensity, you know, just breathing in fresh air and yeah, there's all sorts of gifts. Because that's going to give you a whole lot more resilience moving forward when it is normal, quote unquote. Um, so if just to wrap things up with all that you've done in this area, what are the three tips that you most frequently give the tiny steps that people can take that pop up the most for you when people are asking like, what can I do? What, how can I start? Uh, the first is, is to every day ask that question to yourself. What do I need for myself and really stop and give yourself, you know, a few minutes to really listen to the answer. Like, what do I need for myself? Censorship buttons off. It's not about what other people think, but like, what am I feeling? Like, what do I need? Whether it's exercise or a nap or whatever it is. That's number one. Number two, regards to our devices, because these things aren't going away. I challenge you that when you were on these things that you pay attention to how you feel. So it, if it comes to a point of you're scrolling and you can feel the energy drain, set it aside. I'm not suggesting we take entire days off or go on a massive detox, although that's not a bad thing either, but just pay attention to how you feel. And if you're starting to feel negative because of this thing, set it aside and do something that's going to fill you up. Um, and the third tip, geez, that's a good one. I mean, I have so many of them, but um, you know, when it comes to resilience, I think that I would remind all of you that all of the things that we do to take care of our health is that we have direct control of when we have so little control of so much that's happening around us right now. So it is, um, you know, move a little bit every single day, eat just a little healthier. And I'm not saying get rid of everything that you love because I love good food mm -hmm. and the good wine that goes with it, you know, <laughs> make sure you get the sleep that you need. That's the more most powerful thing. I think that we need in the resilience front these days, quality sleep, because that's when our body repairs from stress and it makes sure you're getting enough hydrating fluids. I mean, it sounds so ridiculously simple, but what we do to take care of this is going to feed this and it's going to, you know, drive success. Great. Well, Michelle, it is always, always, always an absolute delight. Uh, and what I'd like to ask you is if you can sh show your thanks to Michelle with the emojis, but also type in the chat, what's your biggest takeaway from this? As I, uh, and uh, thank you so much, so much, Michelle. Thank you. And don't forget to go over to my booth. I've left a link there to my oh, yes. webpage where you can get, um, I'm sharing a, a Success Energy book offer. Uh, I've got a freebie on assessing autopilot uh, to see, check out where you are with that. I have got a um, Mesh for Health mini book, PDF download. So move, eat, sleep and hydrate health. Um, and uh, you can sign up for my weekly messages and uh, get a little bit more of Michelle in your inbox. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, That's incredibly program. generous. Thank you. So just I, go to the booth, such... the link is there. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for having me, Ravi. I always enjoy chatting with you. Yes, it is a delight. And just to wrap things up, I, I, I want to let you guys know about, well, I goofed, I messed up. Uh, with something that I, I had told you um, that one part of this ramp up for your resilience summit, I'm having a, this, these four days, I'm bringing you four incredible experts to bring you their expertise. There's also a VIP workshop I am doing where I'll be sharing some of my techniques for resilience, but not just for resilience, but how you move forward in these crazy turbulent times. And what I had set up was a um, questionnaire. I wanted to make sure the right people are in it. It's free, you know, it's, it's free as well, just like the summit, but something glitched with this questionnaire. I, 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 I tested it, but somehow it glitched. So we've only got a few days. We talked yesterday with Vince about how sometimes you can't control everything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, if this calls to you, you are not only feeling this heaviness, but feeling 
the drain from others asking for support, people at work, family, uh, friends, community, all those. And, and it's, and that sluggishness that, that auto we talked about, uh, I'm going to trust that the right people are going to apply. I have no time to change it. So I'm going to practice what I preach and trust. So I've changed the page. I'm going to, I have to change the video. So if it calls to you, uh, go to ravitangri.com slash VIP, uh, and you can sign up immediately for it. And I'll trust the universe. The right people are going to be there. Uh, so there's no question air anymore. Just sign up and I will see you on May 2nd for that. And tomorrow we go on with day three with Kate Collins, author of the powerhouse in you and sharing her insights and expertise. We will wrap up this week with, uh, Patricia Morgan on Thursday. So thank you. Thank you so much. And take a look in the booths in the, uh, booth area, loads of Richard Michelle's that she's talked about. Uh, and, and also our sponsors. And then, uh, Michelle, will you be in the social lounge? If anyone wants to ask you questions, yeah. table one, table one. All right. So we will see you there folks. Bye-bye.